Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's a blessing to be with you. So, last week we started a just a very brief two-part sermon series on the emotional life of Jesus. We're going to finish that up uh, today, the second part. And the, the basis, the premise of this series is the idea that it's impossible to be spiritually mature while being emotionally immature. It's impossible to be spiritually mature while being emotionally immature. And we're honing in on the emotional life of Christ. We are to be his followers. And there are not only things to learn um, in other parts of Jesus' life, but the way that he dealt with and handled human emotions, uh, there are a lot of things for us to learn there. Today, we're going to talk about the passions of Christ. Now, this week that we're in, what, what do people normally call this week? Passion Week, passion week right? Um, and the reason that it's called Passion Week, um, it's not necessarily the way that you and I think about passion. When we think about passion, we think about um, strong emotion. But the reason this week is called Passion Week, it actually comes from the Latin word, passio, which means to endure suffering. And it's really um, the, this week, uh, of the last week of life's Christ, was uh, a week where he endured great suffering. And so it's called, based on that Latin word, it's called Passion Week. And yet, in that last week, when Christ endured great suffering, we can also see his passion his emotions clearer than any other place in his whole life. And so today, we're going to dive in and look at the Passion Week and the passions that Christ shows during that time. Before we do that, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord God, um, Jesus is so amazing. He's always more amazing than we can ever really think or say or imagine. And I just pray that today as we think about Christ in that last week, I pray that His heart, His passion would move ours. We pray this in His name. Amen. Before we start um, looking at Passion Week, I just want to again remind us um, of why the emotions of Christ are so significant for you and I in our everyday life. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 17, talking about Jesus, it says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, meaning Jesus, likewise shared in the same. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Jesus is God who became man, who became like us. And here in Hebrews, it says he becomes like us in all things. He becomes fully human. And that includes human emotions. We saw last week that Jesus gets angry and experiences sadness and uh, sorrow and loneliness and the whole gamut, the whole spectrum of human emotions. In fact, in Isaiah 53, Jesus is, not, is called, Jesus is called the man of sorrows who is acquainted with grief. He knows grief. He understands it. But it's not just grief or pain in general that he's acquainted with. It's our pain. Isaiah 53 says he carries our sorrows. He walked on this earth and experienced our pain, our rejection, betrayal, crushing sadness. He ultimately dies of a broken heart. He felt our pain. He felt it then, and he feels it now. So what he experienced 
is what you and I experience. And not only can we find lessons in Jesus and how he lived then, but we can know that he understands now what we are going through. Every emotion that you've experienced, anger, sadness, loneliness, pain, heartbreak, even guilt. He himself was never guilty, but felt the weight of the world's guilt upon him. Every emotion that you have experienced, Jesus himself has experienced. He knows. He understands. He became like us. And ultimately, he did so so that we could become like him. His experience is transformational. He became like us so that we may become like him. So with that background, we're going to go to Passion Week. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to start at the night that Jesus is going to be betrayed. He's experienced that last supper that communion meal with his disciples. They've gone out of the upper room. They are making their way along the, the brook Kidron toward Gethsemane. And as they are traveling, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, using these moments to tell them some of the last things he wants to share with them. And as he's speaking with them, I want you to notice what he says here in John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Now, don't we want to experience fullness of joy? That's something that we all desire and long after. But notice what Jesus is promising here. He's not just promising, I'm going to give you joy. I'm going to make you joyful. Where does the joy come from? What's the source of joy? Whose joy is it? He says, my joy, the joy that is in me, the joy that I have, I'm going to give it to you. And it's going to stay there with you. And as my joy is in you, your joy will be Full. Sounds pretty good, right? Sign me up. Except, I don't think the disciples at that moment realized the path that Jesus would have to walk in order to reach his joy. I do not think at that moment they realized the cost of Jesus' joy. But just a few verses later, chapter 16, he's going to tell them. John 16, these are the verses we read as our scripture reading. He and his disciples are still traveling on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And notice what he says to them. Most assuredly, I say to you, so he's putting emphasis here. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament. So he's promised them joy. And now he's promising them weeping and lamentation. You will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful. And notice, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. So where's that joy that Jesus is promising them? Where does it come from? It's joy that is birthed out of sorrow. It is sorrow transformed and reborn and remade into joy. This is what he is promising his disciples. And then he gives them this illustration. Perhaps the best illustration he could have chosen from the human experience. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish 
for joy that a human being has been born into the world. You moms out there, you know, <laughs> right? The pain, the agony, the sorrow when your hour has come. But once that baby is born, that sorrow is transformed, isn't it? It is transformed into joy. And my wife, she's not in here in the moment, she's with our child, but she would tell you there is something that happens in a mother's mind that almost makes them forget the agony and pain that they go through. I mean, why, how else could they, they have multiple children, right? They, they somehow forget, and the joy replaces the sorrow. And this is the human experience that Jesus has chosen to, to tell the disciples, this is your path to experiencing joy. You're going to experience tremendous sorrow. You're going to weep and you're going to lament. It's going to be like a woman in labor. Some of the most intense pain that humans could ever endure or go through. But it also brings one of the greatest joys, doesn't it? Those of you who have held your child in your arms after they have been born, I mean, that moment of joy, it's indescribable. And Jesus is saying, you are going to go through the darkest, worst, most painful experience you've ever had. And out of that experience, out of that sorrow, is going to be birthed the greatest joy that you've ever known. And by the way, whose joy did we say it was? Jesus' joy. And we're going to see that this is not only the path to joy for the disciples, that the path to experiencing fullness of joy leads through sorrow and despair and lamentation, but for Jesus as well, who they are following. The path to His joy leads through sorrow that you and I can't even imagine. So today, in these next few moments... We're going to focus in on these two emotions of Jesus here in this Passion Week. Sorrow that is transformed into joy. So, of course, we begin with sorrow. Jesus, as he is talking to the disciples, they make their way along the Kidron Brook. They start climbing up that hill called Gethsemane where Jesus will spend some time in prayer. Now, I've, I've had the privilege of actually going there to Gethsemane. It's, it's a, this, this hill, it's not a mountain, it's a, it's a hill that's overlooking uh, the city of Jerusalem, and it's covered with olive trees. In fact, some of those olive trees um, go back hundreds, even a thousand years or more, these ancient trees that are there. And that's where... Gethsemane got its name. Because Gethsemane literally means oil press. Even in Jesus' time, that hillside was covered with olive trees. And there, apparently, in Gethsemane, was a press. Where those, olive oil, those olives are pressed to produce oil. Now, if you have olives and you want oil, the path to getting that oil is that the olives must be crushed. They must be pressed and squeezed. And so the olives are harvested, and depending on the type of press, uh, some were a, a stone wheel that would be rolled uh, around a track over top of the olives. Others were, were heavy stones that were placed on top, and there was a... Um, uh, a screw that would press them down. But this weight is pressed upon the olives, and the olives are actually pressed three times. So the first time the olives are pressed, you get uh, the finest oil, the extra virgin 
olive oil, the oil that would be used in the sanctuary, the oil that would be used for anointing. Um, by the way, do you remember what the word Messiah means? The anointed one. And for a service, like anointing a king, anointing a priest, you would take that extra virgin olive oil and you would pour it over them. You would anoint them as a symbol of God's presence and Holy Spirit upon them. The second pressing was the oil that would come, that would come from the second pressing would be used for cooking. As you prepared food, um, you would use that oil for cooking. And the third pressing of the olives, that lower inferior quality of oil that would come out, that last bit of oil that is left there in the olives, that would be what would be used to burn lamps and to give light. And after the olives are crushed three times, they're spent. There's no more oil to come out. And here in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus himself being crushed and pressed. Matthew 26, you can turn with me there. And as we go through these verses, I want you to count with me. I want you to count with me how many times Jesus prays and asks the Father to remove the cup from him. Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46, we're page 964. If you're using one of the Bibles from the pew, when you get there, you can say amen. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, seeing my betrayer is at hand. Jesus said, when that woman is in labor, when her hour has come, she experiences incredible pain and sorrow. And here we can see the moment when Jesus' own hour had come. And did you notice how many times he prays? Three times he calls out to the Father. If there's any other way, if this can, can, can happen through any other means, nevertheless, not what I will but what you will. And even though he didn't want to, and even though he knew it would crush him to death, he surrendered. And he drank that cup. The cup that was full of your pain and mine. 
your shame and your guilt and mine. And make no mistake, in that cup which made Christ tremble, not a single ingredient that has ever made man's cup bitter was left out. There's not one kind of misery or distress, not one kind of burden, no amount of anguish which can weigh upon and wear out a human heart that was missing. He tasted it all. Whether quiet tears or screaming agony, he drank it all. You and I, Though our suffering can be great, have only our own suffering to taste and no one else's. Our nerves, our hearts only feel our own pain. You and I only get a single drop of what was in that cup. But Jesus drank the whole cup of human suffering. Three times. He cries out, and he is crushed and crushed and crushed until, as Mark puts it, the sweat coming out of him is drops of blood. Jesus drank the entire cup of your suffering and mine. And by the way, notice what he does in this moment when he's experiencing sorrow that will lead to death. By the way, it's not the cross that kills him, right? Broken heart. The the cross was designed to actually prolong death. People were to, the cross was engineered, crucifixion was engineered so that people would be on the cross for days. That's why they give them something to drink, right? So they wouldn't die of dehydration there. That they could be on the cross for days, even weeks or more. Jesus does not die because of the cross. He dies because of the weight of sin and the separation that it brings. And yet, what does he do in that moment of agony? He goes to his father, right? That's what he longs to to do. That's where he wants to be. He is headed for that garden so he can pray and be with his father and have this conversation. Yes, he longs for human comfort, but even more so, he longs for the comfort of his father. Notice what he says in John 16, 32. Indeed, the hour is coming, yea, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered. He's talking to his disciples. Each to his own and will leave me alone. Have you ever been left alone in your sorrow? You will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. The only consolation that Christ has, his his disciples leave him, they betray him. The only consolation he has is the comfort he has with his Father. And yet, we are told that even that is taken from him. That even that connection between Jesus the Son and God the Father is broken. And as he's there on the cross, his back is lacerated, his hands and ankles are nailed, and what is it that causes him to cry out? What is it that is the burden and the agony of his heart? His emotional pain is so great that he doesn't even seem to cry out because of the physical pain. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, he cries out in Aramaic, 
Aramaic. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now Christ drinks the very last drops in that cup and experiences the separation that sin brings between humans and God. And he is separated so that he cannot see, cannot experience, cannot feel the comfort from his Father that he had known from eternity past. And now, in that moment, when his heart is broken beyond imagination, he is alone. And it's at this moment that we need to recognize something that's very different about Christ's suffering and the suffering that you and I experience. Because in Christ's suffering, he had a temptation that he faced that you and I have never faced. He had an option available to him that you and I don't have available to us. And that is simply with only a thought or a word, he could have made all of his suffering vanish in an instant. In that garden, when he looked into that cup and knew what it meant, he chose it. It was not forced upon him. The Father didn't make him do it. He chose the cup of suffering. When the soldiers came and Peter pulls out his sword and he's ready to to, to make a stand there, Jesus heals the ear. And he says to Peter, don't you know? Just a word from me. And legions of angels would come and deliver me. No man can take my life from me. I willingly lay it down. And there on the cross, broken from human connection and divine connection, and they are ridiculing him. If you're the Messiah, if you're the king of Jews, if you can save others, come down. Come down off of that cross. And he could have, couldn't he? He could have. Every moment, every moment of unimaginable, excruciating, emotional pain that was crushing him and breaking his heart, he could have chosen differently. And yet, he stays. Yet, he drinks the cup, he stays on the cross. And breathes his last breath until it is finished. Why? How? Why would he do such a thing? How could he endure such pain? The promise that was true for the disciples was true for Jesus as well. He told them, your sorrow, notice he doesn't say your sorrow is going to be replaced by joy. That's not the equation here. Your sorrow will be transformed into joy. I'm going to take that pain, I'm going to take what you've gone through, and it's going to be reborn like a a butterfly emerging from its chrysalis. It's going to be changed into joy. And isn't that true of the sorrow Jesus experienced? He dies there on the cross Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, his disciples are, are, are weeping, they're, they're, they're brokenhearted, they're devastated. 
And yet Sunday morning, that first day of the week, that day when the recreation really begins, Jesus emerges from the tomb, having conquered death, having conquered sin, and his sorrow has been transformed into joy. That which was so horrible and painful and shameful has become glorious and amazing and full of hope and love. His sorrow was changed into joy. The old gave birth to the new. By the way, we're going to talk about his joy in just a minute here, but I, I just want to linger here for a moment on his sorrow one last time. Because the truth is, we've all got it. And if we, like Jesus, can face it, you know, often we're tempted to try to run from our sorrow, right? And, and, and we can't ever make it go away, but maybe we can distract ourselves away from it or push it down and pretend it's not there. Or maybe we can find some sort of substance to drown it out. We, we, we try to run from it and, 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 and to, to avoid drinking that drop, that cup. But if we can face it, like Jesus did, and be fully honest and fully deal with the, the, the sorrow that is in our hearts that racks our minds and, 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 and devastates us and take that sorrow and bring it into the presence of God and stay with it there. Because the truth is, God has promised that our sorrow will be transformed into joy, but it hasn't all happened yet, has it? And we are so often in this in-between place. Friday has passed, and Sunday has not arrived, and we're in this in-between place where we're experiencing the devastation and the sorrow, and it has not yet been changed. And what do we do with it? How do we deal with it? We hold on. And we hold on to God and stay in His presence and trust that just as He transformed the sorrow of Jesus Christ into the most amazing joy, He will do the same for us. And that one day, there's going to be a new creation and a resurrection and the tears are going to be wiped from our eyes and there's going to be no more sorrow or pain or suffering. And all that we have gone through will be made new. And all that loss and all that suffering and all that pain is only going to make the joy and the togetherness and the love so much sweeter. But until that day, while we're in that in-between place, we got to hang on to God and hang on to His promise and know that He's been there too and that He understands. Hebrews 12 says that as we're running this race, when we're not yet to the end, we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him. How could Jesus do it? Why did he do it? He did it. He said yes to that cup. 
He was captured in that garden. He stayed on that cross. He was crushed till every drop was drained for the joy that was set before him. And by the way, that joy can be nothing else, nobody else other than you and I. We are the child that is born through the labor of Christ. We are the new life that comes. We are. Our salvation, eternity with us, is the joy to Jesus that is so sweet it outweighs the pain he endured on the cross. I mean, just think about it. He says, your pain and my pain, it's going to be like when that mother has the baby and she can't even, your joy and my joy is going to be like when that mother has the baby and she can't even remember the pain. Because the joy is so great. God's delight in me. The joy that he experiences in our presence, in our salvation, is greater. Is greater than the suffering that Jesus endured on the cross. Let that sink in. Which means, who is the most joyful being in the universe? Who is the happiest being in the universe? Who has the fullness of joy? Jesus Christ. His hour came. He labored for you and I. And he came through on the other side. And his grief was transformed into joy. And that's the hope of the resurrection. Not only that Jesus has earned our salvation, but that we can experience His joy. The joy that was greater than even the pain that He endured the joy that was the reason that he stayed, the reason that he chose us. And by the way, Jesus not only paid the price for our joy, but he is now a living Savior, a living priest, who is there in the presence of God. He is not only the hope of our joy, but He is the one who understands our pain. The Bible says that when He ascended after His resurrection, He rose to the right hand of God where He is a faithful high priest for us. Notice Hebrews 4, 14-16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, our frailty, our pain, our suffering, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. He knows us. He understands. He gets us. He's been there. He has not only felt pain, he has felt your pain. Therefore, notice what it says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. As we're in this in-between time, as our sorrow is still real and present and has not yet been transformed into joy, we can find comfort and grace at the throne of Jesus Christ because He's been there, He knows, and He understands. In His presence. There's healing, there's comfort, and there's hope. And as we are there in His presence, not only does He bring us healing now, does He only does He help us get through now, but we have the promise that we will one day share in His joy. These things I have spoken to you 
that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Whatever sorrow, whatever pain, whatever brokenness that is there, the wounds that won't heal and won't disappear, take it to Jesus. He knows, he understands, and ultimately he transforms our sorrow into joy.